So just to say hello to everyone. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Marley Bauer. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Middle Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of Sydney. And today I'm really happy to welcome you to what will be a really exciting webinar and the first of a series in collaboration between the Middle Centre and the Henry Halloran Trust, looking at the relationship between the built environment and mental health. And I think that given the past few months all around the world with COVID um, has made this relationship particularly clear for all of us because there's nothing like being contained in one place in your home for months on end to realise how detrimental certain aspects of your built environment can be for your mental health. Well, that could just be me. But I think that this interest began for us through a workshop between academics and practitioners um, from psychology and mental health, um, physical health, urban planning and architecture, where in our own experiences of work in practice or in research, we had noticed the relationship between the built environment and mental health, but we didn't have so much of a common language um, to know how to link these concepts together. So, for example, in my own research, I've looked at the experience of loneliness amongst people who are currently or formerly homeless and found that the inequity in the type and quality of houses and spaces that's often allotted to people exiting homelessness in our society um, often don't take into account the personal needs and desires of this group to their detriment. So we focus on forming a network uh, that's collaborative and interdisciplinary uh, to look at this uh, relationship in more detail. And we had several aims. The first is to bring together researchers, policymakers, and practitioners currently working independently across silos and bring them together to share skills and expertise and develop networks and frameworks. We also want to promote the role of mental health in built environment research and practice and vice versa to promote um, built environment and mental health research and practice settings. We want to build capacity to translate research evidence into public health and planning policy and practice through inbuilt partnerships um, with practitioners in the field. So if as a practitioner, researcher or policymaker, you'd like to either join the network or build a list to hear about uh, future events or publications, just um, send me an email and you should receive an email tomorrow with my contact details. We'd love to hear from you. So now over to who you've come to see, Laura. Um, so when first reflecting on this area, um, the first person I heard about was Laura McGrath, who had been pioneering this space for quite some time in the UK. So it's a real boon to have her speak at our first webinar, especially when it is first thing in her morning in the UK. So she's a lecturer um, in psychosocial mental health at the Open University in the UK. Before joining the OU, uh, Laura taught at the University of East London for eight years where she was program leader for the Bachelor of Clinical and Community Psychology degree. Her research concentrates on the role of the material environment in experiences of mental health, care and recovery. And her work is interdisciplinary, drawing on social community and critical psychology, as well as human geography and social theory to explore psychosocial and material aspects of mental health experiences. She's investigated the role of the built environment in many settings, including psychiatric settings and forensic psychiatric units, amongst others. And this work led Laura to co-edit the recent volume, The Handbook of Mental Health and Space, Clinical and Community Applications. So the plan tonight is for Laura to speak for um, half an hour to 40 minutes and then open up for questions. So there's a Q&A box in the bottom of your screen, or there should be, um, so you can record questions as they come up during Laura's talk. But let me know if you'd rather have your question read out by me or if you want to just ask it yourself, and we'll try and make the webinar technology work um, to figure it out. But I have to say, it's my first hosting webinar experience, so I can't promise anything magical, but we'll give it a go. So over to you, Laura. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm inviting me. Oh, just a minute. I have to do the. I'm going to try and share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that? Um, so, hello. Thank you so much for Marley for inviting me. It's really exciting to speak to you from the other side of the world. Um, and I'm really glad that um, people are interested in doing this kind of work. I've 
been looking at this topic for um, just over a decade now and um, I'm going to talk through today some um, of the kind of background uh, reasons why I've done this work, some of the relevant literature and then some of the findings from the various studies that I've done in this area. So um, I've called my talk today Space and Mental Distress. So I tend to use the slightly broader term space than the built environment in particular and that's because included in our psychological engagement with um, the material environments we live in is not only the kind of built environment but also how we think about and conceptualize spaces, how we organize them, what kind of things we're meant to do in particular spaces and others on the more macro level than the built environment which shapes what built environments we have and also the really micro level as well I'm interested in kind of how do people engage with objects in their lives, how do we use objects to kind of manage and understand our psychological experiences. So I think that space kind of encompasses the kind of macro to the micro when we're thinking about how the built environment comes into people's um, psychological experiences. So why, um, why did I sort of start being interested in this topic? Well, um, my uh, background is in psychology and mental health, as Molly said, and in um, the UK and I think in most, if not all, Western industrialized countries, um, the past 50 years or so have seen a huge change in the spaces that are allocated for mental health care. So um, up, in, up until the sort of middle of the 20th century and in the UK up until the 1990s, the main place that was allocated for the care um, and treatment of mental health was places like this, was um, asylum. Um, these were places which were large institutions out of town normally, and people were often sent there for long periods of time, some for many, many years. And these were, there were many good reasons to shut the asylums down. There was a lot of um, abuse that went on in these institutions. Um, but what this has meant in the shutting down of these asylums is that people who are navigating mental health problems, um, either crisis, recovery, um, treatment, have gone from largely, or not entirely, being in places like this, which are established purely for that purpose, to navigating their distress across multiple spaces. Um, and these include some, um, um, some um, institutional places still, so like community mental health services, like we still have institutions, psychiatric wards, um, but also everyday spaces like homes, um, like shopping places, social places, natural spaces, everyday places. So what we've gone from is a very clear demarcation spatially between spaces to be mad and spaces to be sane. You know, if you're in the asylum, you're designated as being mad, if you're out of it, you're broadly designated as being sane or not mad, to this really complicated relationship where people are navigating distress and crisis and recovery and treatment even in the same spaces where they're also navigating their everyday lives and kind of doing lots of different things as well. So that, while there was lots and lots of work on um, the institutionalization and the impact on services and people, there wasn't much on what this, what they actually, this spatial change had meant for people's lives. So kind of where this originally came from. So, oh, sorry. So why, why would this matter? Well, um, we know that um, where people are is really important for people's mental health. So the first um, indication of this uh, was studies done in Chicago in the 1930s, 1930s. So the map on the left here is uh, Farris and Dunham, and they mapped the incidence of schizophrenia in, um, in Chicago. And what they found is that, um, as you can see, the dark, darker bits on the map are the higher incidence. So those inner city um, poorer areas had much higher incidence of schizophrenia than the um, kind of more affluent um, suburbs. And part of that, of course, is um, we know that there's a social gradient in mental health. So people um, who are poorer are more likely to um, experience their mental health problems. But there seems to be an additional 
factor here of the neighbourhood and particularly of urbanicity in mental health. So on the right here we have a map of um, from England, uh, which again is people experiencing a long-term mental health problem. And um, you can see here that the darker bits again are the higher incidence and the, um, the bit on its own on the, um, the left is London, the central parts, the more urban parts, um, the poorer areas are again have higher levels and the two blocks in the north of the country, the northwest is the kind of urban centres, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, people know the UK and then there's another urban cluster up in the northeast again which is where there are more cities. Um, so even though some of the other areas of the country are, are poorer, um, so the southwest, for instance, that kind of long bit sticking out the bottom, um, that's one of the poorest areas of the country, but it's also one of the more rural and it has much um, lower incidence of, of mental health. So this is one of the, um, the sort of earliest and very uh, established ways in which we know that certain types of neighbourhoods, particularly poorer, um, the literature calls them disorganised, I think that's a little bit rude, so I think you can think of that as insecure, um, unstable kind of places where there's lots of movement, where um, people don't have that much security, are places where people tend to have um, higher levels of mental health issues. And in, um, uh, Marley uh, kindly mentioned the book that um, it's an edited collection with Paula Reedy, and in our introduction there, we looked at the broader literature on kind of neighbourhood and environment and mental health. And some of it is looks at mental health and some of it looks at well-being. So in this area, there's often you kind of some of the literature looks at the negative impact of some of the um, we kind of organized that literature thinking about these four uh, psychological elements of ways that really these kinds of environments can get under the skin so it kind of become part of people's um, experiences and one of them is status and value so know that um, living you know that in our kind of capitalist society that wealth is equated with worth in many ways and people living in low status environments in low status jobs um, in low status housing all of those things are one of the kind of pathways in which um, which affects people's mental health. Um, there seems to be a big protective factor of trust and belonging, so closer knit communities are more protected um, and generally more trusting societies have um, better levels of mental of, of well-being and um, that's also linked against this kind of status and value because more equal societies are more trusting and have better levels of mental health as well. Um, and that's true on the neighbourhood level. Um, there's also some sort of an impact as well of, of power and agency and the kind of power that people have over their lives. So people who are in poorer neighbourhoods, for instance, but who have um, feel like they have uh, control over local decision making, have better levels of well-being, that's more protected um, from the kind of stresses and strains and inequities of living on low income. Um, and finally, uh, safety, security and respite. So as I mentioned, insecurity and instability. There's quite a lot of literature showing that um, places with high crime levels, um, people have um, worse mental health, um, places where people don't feel safe, um, and also where people don't have um, respite. And I'll talk about that a bit on the next slide. So these are some, it's just one way to cut up the literature really, but it's quite complicated the ways in which people's um, these sort of environments that we know are not particularly can be quite toxic for people's mental health but kind of actually go into our uh, come under the skin and go into our psychological experiences and we can see very similar themes um, if we go down to the level of the built environment and the kind of specific um, environments in which people are living so one of the, um, there's, there's quite a lot of research has been done looking at um, the kind of housing that people live in, particularly housing quality and housing type. And unsurprisingly, it's found that poor quality housing is worse for your mental health. And generally, um, multiple occupancy housing is often pinpointed as 
big, something that's quite um, detrimental for people. But there's not equality within multiple occupancy housing. It's not sort of just that living in kind of these larger environments is bad. It depends on their design and their layout and the way in which they're kind of seen um, within the neighbourhood as well. Um, but one thing we do know is there's a number of studies showing that people who live higher up tower blocks um, have worse mental health. And um, this is particularly the case for um, mothers, young mothers with children, not necessarily young, but mothers with young children. Um, and um, who, and it's been, it's been um, argued that's because they are more trapped and they don't have access to play areas or to other parents. Um, so that's, um, and also uh, the design is important as well. So this middle picture is a kind of open deck um, housing, um, multiple occupancy housing design. And these uh, kind of designs where people um, are exposed straight out into the elements, if you like, when they come out and they're kind of quite open and bare are worse for mental health um, than closed corridors or kind of um, flat type arrangements where people are on a, in a kind of um, opposite each other. Um, and also have people living in places of higher levels of helplessness as well. So there seems to be, um, so environmental psychologists who kind of looked at a lot of this um, literature um, have come up with, sort of argue that there are three real elements, mediating elements in um, multiple occupancy housing and urban design. One is personal control. So these sort of open deck designs where people just come out and that's it. Um, a much, um, people don't really have a sense of ownership over the space, whereas um, designs where, for instance, you have a small corridor with some people that you're on, and then you might come out and you're in a block and you have your own communal space in that block, and then you go out and you have a, um, you have a kind of shared space outside. Those actually people seem to have higher levels, less helplessness, higher levels of control in those sort of environments because they have a sense of ownership over, over bits of the space. And they're not just kind of going straight out from their flat into the world and feeling kind of overwhelmed by it. Um, social isolation or kind of the way that where they're facilitating interaction in the spaces is really important as mediator as well. There's a lot of interest in this at the moment in um, in urban design more generally, generally on the other side of trying to build happy cities or resilient places um, and thinking about ways we can make cities more neighbourly and walkable. A lot, of, a lot of that is driven by the idea that we, sh we need to have those sort of just everyday informal interactions um, with people who live near us, which is actually one of the things that lockdown probably brought home to a lot of people. It's just that um, not necessarily people you're friends with, but just seeing people every day is it seems to be quite protective for our well-being. And if you're living in these sort of environments, like this long corridor, it doesn't really facilitate that kind of interaction at all and creates more hostile um, interactions with neighbours. And the, um, the other thing that's um, protective and important is respite and restoration. So and one thing that we know um, from the literature is really important for that is green space. So I have this lovely garden here as well. So um, there's lots of evidence that access to green space, being able to see trees is important for um, all sorts of things. It makes you need to revise better, you recover more quickly from surgery. Um, there's all sorts of um, effects. Um, in terms of housing, there's a study um, done again in Chicago, um, coincidentally, where um, they compared uh, women living in two tower blocks in the same housing project or estate, as we say, in the UK. And they found that um, those, one of their tower blocks was surrounded by trees and the other one wasn't. But apart from that, they were the same, they were on the same site. And they found that the women who, um, both, both sets of women had the same sorts of life events going on. So they, they all had kind of quite stressful lives, um, living in poverty, but the women who could see trees um, rated those life events as less stressful, as less uh, long-term, and also as less, less important and global. So they weren't as overwhelmed by the things that were, were going on, even though the same things were going on for them. 
So that this has led to the idea that screen space is a kind of leads to a kind of form of cognitive restoration or respite that allows people to kind of gather resources to help them cope with everyday life. And that's another really important reason to have trees everywhere, as well as the environment. Okay, so um, thinking about my own work in this area. Uh, so, so I've been doing this um, for over a decade. And um, I think the studies that um, I've done sort of fall into two categories. One is really trying to unpick the experiences of space and the material environment um, in mental health and recovery. So um, this started, excuse me, with my PhD, um, which was 2007 to 12. And that was really looking quite broadly at what, um, how do people in community care in particular experience spaces that they're using. Um, so I talked to current mental health service users and I also looked at autobiographies that people have published um, of their experiences um, over a longer period as well. So moving through the changes that have happened. Um, and um, I've also done um, projects since then, one with newly homeless people uh, with pre-existing mental health problems. So looking at how people navigate this kind of new experience of homelessness. Um, and um, also in secure um, forensic institution, uh, looking at that. So this was an, a forensic institution sort of in line with a lot of places in the UK, just had been rebuilt and redesigned to be um, all meant to be all nice. And um, we were looking at the kind of how the service users and as staff experienced that, those new, that newly designed building. Um, I've also done some work um, which is more directly looking at how we intervene in thinking about space as well. So um, this, this project was um, uh, Jessica Muir, uh, this was her doctoral project which I supervised but I need to talk about some of it. Um, and she looked at a walk and talk group in Hackney in East London which is a very central urban environment. Um, and uh, that, that group is peer led and they go for a walk once a week in around the local area kind of in various ways. So um, she did a lot of work with them thinking about how um, that activity was changing their experiences of, of space and living in the neighbourhood. Um, and uh, this graffiti and wellbeing project um, is working in a forensic, uh, sorry, secure mental health environment again. Um, and this is working with an artist, uh, Ben Wakeling, who does graffiti um, with the um, men who are um, who are living there. Uh, and you can see across all of these um, projects, uh, I tend to take a qualitative approach. Um, we do some mixed methods sometimes, see a survey in there. Um, and I also use a lot of visual methods and that's really um, because it, people find it hard to talk about space and the material environment because they're not used to thinking about it really. But if you get people to take photos or draw things, uh, draw those places, then it tends to open up what people are able to talk about a little bit more. Um, so you can see an example in the back of the slide is one of the maps that Patricia drew of kind of her um, spaces in mental health. In the, in, um, in the community. So um, I'm going to talk about some of the themes that have come across these studies. So I'm not going to talk about them one by one and I'm mainly going to focus on the um, stuff in the community rather than the um, institutional spaces uh, today. But if you've got any questions about the other, um, other ones, I'm very happy to answer them later. Okay. Oh yeah, and um, thinking about some theoretical um, approaches. So there's a, um, as Marley said at the beginning, this is an area where there's a lot of relevant things out there um, um, in kind of many, many disciplines, but they're, it's, they're not that often brought together. So there's been a lot of work more recently um, thinking about materiality, it's becoming more common. <coughs> But these are just a couple of the 
theoretical way to think about this that I've found particularly fruitful and useful. So um, first of all, I've been really influenced by a lot of the work in human and cultural geography. So unsurprisingly, geographers are very good at thinking about this. It's their main uh, purpose, their discipline is to think about place and space. Um, and one of the um, reasons I think why maybe in psychology in, or in the social sciences more general, this was, wasn't talked about for quite a long time is because we have this idea um, the way that we organize our disciplines is often divides up the social and the material. So we have the social and psychological, the kind of mind, which are not necessarily things which have place or are embodied in um, lots of traditional Western ways of thinking about those things, are kind of siphoned off to the social sciences and psychology. And the material, um, our material environments are, are given over to the sciences, to medicine, to architecture. To, um, to engineering, to things that deal with you know, real solid things, um, whereas the social is kind of this more ephemeral thing that we have to talk about over here instead. Um, and so one of the really useful things I think is to think about the ways in which these come together and they're not actually separate. And uh, Doreen Massey, who this picture is of, was a cultural geographer and she talks about how space is uh, both socially produced and socially productive. So every time we have, every experience we have, every interaction we have is in a place, how, is it in a material context. We are never divorced from the material context. Um, in, we can't have any experience without being somewhere. And she talks about how the spaces that we, um, how we arrange them are socially produced. So I think a good way to, um, a good example of this is to think about a traditional lecture theatre. So we've all been in one of those, I'm sure, where you have you know, the lectern at the front and then this big bank of students who sit there. And that space has been produced by particular ideas for education. So the idea that the teacher kind of has knowledge that they then impart onto the students who accept it passively. And because of that idea of education, we've created that kind of space. Also so we can teach lots of people at once. Um, but it's still, it's that, that feeds into that um, thing. So that lecture theatre isn't just arranged, but it's socially produced by the ideologies and ideas that we have about education. But then once, once places exist, once material environments exist, they also do things to us as well. They kind of call on us to act and be in certain ways. So that's what she means by being socially productive as well. So when you go into that lecture theatre, again, because it exists now, and the teacher stands at the front and all the students sit down, it puts people back into that relationship. And if people have tried to teach in those places, you know, it's very difficult to teach in any other way than a kind of imparting information, um, open lecture kind of way. You can't really teach in a peer-led way there, for instance. So the space puts you back into that relationship. And that's true of kind of all of the spaces that we encounter, they kind of call, put us into particular positions or limits the ways in which we we act and think in those particular places and another concept i found really useful is this idea of affordance which is from uh, ecological psychology <coughs> so this is really that um, if we think about the environment as not necessarily forcing us to do things but offering possibilities that we can take up or not so um a, an example of this is um, a pool of water. If you have a, some, a place with a pool of water in it, then that offers or affords lots of different possibilities for people. So if you can take a pool of water, you can, um, you can wash, you can swim, you can um, paddle, you can drown, or you can ignore it. You know, this, the, um, the meaning and the use of the environment doesn't actually, isn't inherent in the environment itself, in the water, and it's not inherent in the person coming in either, but it emerges in the interaction between the two. So if we think of the environment as offering us possibilities, which people take up or kind of resist or do various things with, but, it, but the environment affords, it offers you some possibilities much more strongly than others. And finally, um, from the um, emotional and mental health geography. Um, in terms of mental health, there's this really um, useful 
idea they talk about how um, different spaces um, afford different ways of feeling. I sometimes think of these as feeling rules, which is the term nicked from um, hostile in sociology, uh, where she talks about the rules that we have about why, how you're meant to feel in particular situations. And I think this is also, there are, there's some um, aspects of that in spaces as well. So particularly if we think about how we organize emotions, um, in um, then emotions are often and distress are things that are meant to be private, are things that are done more easily in private spaces, whereas our public spaces are more uh, rational kind of places. Um, and so we can see that that um, the idea of that from the asylum that I talked about at the beginning that you have um, this the, in the the rest of the outside of the asylum is kind of the rationality and sanity and inside the asylum is for, for madness. There's some kind of echoes of that that can be able to talk about that in a second. But we have um, this idea that we don't just, can't just do everything anywhere, but the spaces that exist kind of have existing rules that we all respond to and use. So this quote from Le Tour, I would think is very um, evocative. So when we think about the things that exist around us, that they don't just, they're not just there, they don't just sit there, but they authorise, allow, afford, encourage, permit, suggest, influence, block, render possible, forbid, and so on. So they're always kind of actors in, um, if you're not conscious, in the, in the kind of experiences and interactions that we're going to have in that space. Or well, I don't know. Okay, so um, to move on to um, thinking about our, my, my data, so um, one of the, um, so um, as I just uh, was talking about, there's this, um, that we have these, this kind of general organisation of space that, um, which seems to have continued beyond closing the asylums. So although we've got rid of these kind of out -town spaces, public spaces, especially kind of um, everyday spaces like shopping malls, busy kind of um, train stations, those kind of real, real public spaces um, seem to be particularly hostile to people experiencing distress. So what I mean by that is that you know, people would be um, are much more likely to invoke censure if they publicly display distress there, they're more likely to get picked by the police and more like detection and things like that. Um, but what this meant when um, my participants were talking about the, their kind of going about their everyday lives is that if they were in a state of distress and they were feeling particularly low, they also found it really uncomfortable to be in public places. Um, so Lou in the top quote here talks about this additional level of distress that happens in public spaces. So. She um, feels really uncomfortable, feels really exposed, and has to sort of go home um, in response uh, to being in public space. Um, and so we hear, we think about this idea of feeling rules and kind of what you're allowed to do in different places. Instead, talks about how at home she feels like more of her emotions happen in home space. More, there's this wider range that can happen there because you're allowed to feel everything, whereas you have to kind of um, in a different interview, someone called it put on your social face, you kind of got this idea of performance, you're performing your, your public self, which doesn't include the darkest and deepest emotions. So lots of um, things up again and again in the data. Um, and of course, there's a bit of a problem here for, for some people, they could go home, but for lots of people, of course, home is not a safe or it, place or a sanctuary um, so that was um, but for those participants who had kind of safe homes um, and who had this experience they often talked about the treats um, out of public spaces as really inherent in their experience of crisis and to take this to think about how this impacts on the built environment this is a quote from Zoe um, who was a young woman uh, who'd been in psychiatric care a couple of times and it's time to living in the community and she talks about going to see her psychiatrist um, in um, and 
comparing her psychiatrist's office to another another room where she has um, cognitive behaviour therapy um, and saying that she feels much more able to talk about her distress in the room um, where she has cognitive behaviour therapy and not because she doesn't like a psychiatrist and she doesn't feel comfortable but because the room is much more enclosed and whereas she says here that she sits in a psychiatrist's office and says, I wish there wasn't six windows in here because I want to sit here and cry and feel really bad and it feels too bare for me to do that. And what's interesting here, of course, is that this isn't a public place at all. Um, in fact, no one can see her. Um, she's in a hospital setting and the window isn't looking out onto a public road or anything. It's not like anyone's literally going to see her, but the windows are enough to afford for her this sense of exposure. Um, so one thing that I have noticed is that architects really like windows and putting windows everywhere and of course it can be really good for invoking sense of um, light and space but when people are trying to talk about things that are really um, not welcome, not stigmatised experiences then often um, kind of this, this feeling of exposure um, can be really detrimental. And in a way, Zoe here was quite lucky because lots of people that I've talked to, um, their mental health service buildings have been shut down in, um, in the UK because we've moved to social inclusion for the idea that everybody should be in the community all the time. Um, and they were having to try and have these conversations in public cafes, in pubs even. Um, and we're just finding it impossible to um, be able to disclose these really difficult experiences in places which were just not, um, where they were also having to navigate being a kind of public person um, who's, who's not distressed. So it's a really difficult thing. So, um, that, so that's one kind of um, quite common experience. It's being, um, uh, feeling, when feeling distressed or feeling crisis, really having this, this need to cocoon and to kind of keep, keep the world away. But this wasn't true for everybody at all. Um, and often, um, I don't wanna make causal statements here because I've not done that kind of study at all, but, um, but it's these, this people um, tended to be, if people were having kind of more psychotic um, experiences or manic experiences, then they seem to not necessarily have that um, need to stay inside, but instead have the opposite need to escape confinement and containment in the home. Um, so you see here that Brian, um, the top talks about this kind of claustrophobic feeling of being in the house, of being part of his crisis. So Brian had had um, many kind of um, uh, psychotic crises over 30, 40 years. So he was saying he's noticed that this becomes part of his crisis where he has to leave the house and he often does it at night, which he knows is not a good idea, it's dangerous, but he just gets this need um, to go out. And uh, Julie talks about a similar thing here, um, where she also left the house all the time, but and said, because when she was at home, her um, her voices would get worse, um, everything would come up on top of her, and actually it was very dangerous for her to stay in the house. And this quote, the last quote is from um, a homeless study, and we found this with, with some people who had just given up their homes and left um, in a kind of state of mental health crisis. And you can kind of feel the intensity of this person's distress of being confined, um, of just not being able to cope um, going to leave because of feeling almost like they were choking in the house and of feeling this real sense of, um, of being stifled and being contained. Um, and one of the things that people, and so lots of people would describe leaving the house and then going on kind of lots of adventures almost. So lots of walking around, lots of activity, lots of engaging with people. Um, and often would get into quite serious trouble um, because they were out doing, doing things in public space. Um, and, but what they seemed to be doing to try and do was to really dissipate this intensity of um, their distress and experiences and to gain some kind of agency in relation to these really intense experiences that they were having. 
so this um, quote here is from uh, one of the autobiographies that I looked at and he talks um, so this this man Michael was having a very difficult experience at home where he was um, being attacked um, was having these visions of the four horsemen of the apocalypse were attacking him with the devil and he felt like he they were, they were killing him in his house so it's kind of very symbolic um, um, representation of the same experience as we just talked about and so he went outside and walked around the city where he lived all night and you can see here that he talks about walking because he's walking the devil which is his distress um his kind of trauma um following him but not being able to catch him all night kind of walks around um until the daylight comes where he feels safe again so and this is this is a very evocative way of representing I think, what lots of people were trying to do which was to um gain some control um in relation to these very kind of burgeoning overwhelming experiences and um so rather than feeling overwhelmed by voices instead to feel in control of them so um one of the problems of course so is that as soon as you go out of the house um as we've just discussed in the first slide um there's not really many places where you can go where you're not going to attract um <clears throat> kind of attention or you're not going to feel additionally unsafe because of other reasons so um sandra estroff in her um, ethnography of um community care in um the 1980s in america um uses this phrase nooks and crannies to talk about the kinds of places in public space that people who are um distressed kind of have to find in order to manage their experiences so and one of those things is about being outside um, and being um, so feeling, being able to feel like you're, um, you're dissipating some experiences, but at the same time feel safe and not visible. Um, so we've got this very, um, this is from um, the homelessness study, a man talking about hiding in Hyde Park um, in central London, and he he talks about hiding in the bushes in this way and trying to remain so that he was near near enough people so he felt safe but also so nobody could see him at all and this kind of person existing in public space but not really existing not really having a place there at all um so and julie again here talks about how when she goes out because she feels like she needs to um in order to outrun um her experiences um ends up ends up in the grounds of her psychiatric institution psychiatric hospital and that's because she can't it's the sort of um she can't go anywhere so she can't go into town um into the kind of shopping spaces she can't go be at home she can't be on the ward because those places are both confined um so she has to be in this space which is where she where she's okay where she, people will understand what's happening for her and she's not going to be stigmatized or sectioned um, but at the same time she's outside so she has this feeling of space and um, an agency is retained and that just shows really I think how limited these spaces are and even when people are talking about um, not necessarily these really intense experiences of psychotic crisis but the more um, common experience maybe of going to have therapy in um in a community setting um it still talks again about um how being in therapy involves a kind of experience of emotion and a way of, of being which is not really welcome or um usual in our everyday public spaces so this um um participant Carl he talked about how when he was in therapy he felt like he had to be a pile of pudding so he had to be very open and very um all of his emotions were kind of on the on the outside and were exposed and very vulnerable um and in his everyday life he, he was a sort of uh, middle class middle-aged white man and he had to be very hard and stoic and not show his emotions um and so while there was a space for him to be Know, vulnerable and a space for him to not be vulnerable 
what there wasn't was a space for him to transition between the two. So he, when, it, when I asked him to talk about the mo most important places in his um, community care, one of the places he talked about was the toilet in his services because he said he went into the toilet in order to kind of make himself ready both before therapy and after therapy in order to be able to manage this transition between these two ways of um, being and he talks about it as a decompression zone that he had so he went in the toilet and then he went and sat in a cafe and then he went in a little bit down further down the road and then he would get on the train and go home so he really had to manage this this kind of transition but I think what's notable is there was no kind of space there's no buffer space for him in the community and they're not really this acknowledgement of the fact that you're having to navigate this this real change in your kind of emotional self um, and finally if we think about um recovery um so not necessarily living with um the kind of intense experiences that i've been talking about so far so um there's two examples i want to draw on about how people use their material spaces um so one of the things that uh, i think is important is that people use the objects and space in their life in order to kind of manage their feelings and their emotions also their identity and um and their kind of broader sense of self as well so this first example by from lou uh, so Lee was a young woman who was just left hospital, um, psychiatric hospital, and she was living in supportive housing. Um, in and she really, really hated supportive housing, and she didn't want to be there. She said it was really institutional. She was very resistant to the idea that she would become a kind of long-term service user. Um, she wanted um, it just to be. She just wanted to be out of there. And one of the ways that she talked about doing that was that she didn't engage with the space as a home in any way. So she wouldn't do any chores and she didn't cook while she was there. Um, and which I'm sure was not great for her housemates, but this was the way in which she was managing it. And she had um, in her room um, a lot of kitchen equipment. So for prior to um, her crisis, she'd um, been worked as a chef and she refused to unpack any of her kitchen stuff into the house and it would just sit in the corner um, and she said this was because she didn't want to take these things that were meaningful to her which were a positive part of her identity and her past and make them and integrate them into the space which she just wanted to get rid of she just wanted to be out there and what one of the things I think is really important about this is that her behavior here and the way in which she's arranging her room could be read um, easily as another symptom of, of her depression, um, you know, that she won't, um, she won't unpack, she won't do any chores. But actually for her, this was a way of, of recovering, of maintaining her kind of sense of self, her free crisis sense of self, um, and making sure that she could just move out without kind of taking on too much of the current, the current situation into her long-term identity. Um, so when we've done work in, um, in psychiatric institutions, often hear staff um, say, making comments like, so and so's room is tidy, therefore they're well, so and so's room is not tidy, therefore they're unwell. But people's engagement with objects and the meaning they have is more complex than that. And so it's always good to ask people um, why, what, what the meaning is of the way that which they're arranging things, because it could be like, like Lou that actually. Um, it's the opposite than the meaning it appears. And also um, people are uh, quite creative and in the way in which they use their everyday spaces. And in um, the walking project that I talked about, um, uh, one of the things that we found is that people had um, what we call therapeutic nodes in their environment. So little places that people would go to in order to find um, uh, places of peace or respite, where maybe they were living in relatively harsh urban environments. So this uh, woman, Clara, um, this is the tree that she's talking about here. Um, a palm tree in Hackney, um, which obviously it's quite unusual to have palm trees in London. Um, 
but it's also a relatively unremarkable bit. You know, it's just a, a square in, in the middle of the, um, the, the place. And this is a place where she would go and sit and have a cup of tea and watch the trees. And this was a really important ritual for her. Um, so again, no, places don't, aren't necessarily that exotic or posh looking but can still be really you can use them in these really kind of meaningful ways in order to manage um their recovery and kind of keep um think enliven their everyday spaces but these are often uh, green places so parks canals places like that in this, this study okay so um in conclusion uh so when we're thinking about the material environment um, and psychology, our psychological experiences, mental health, there, there are kind of multiple levels in which we think about um, how these fold into experiences. So um, the built environment is really important. How, how things are arranged is shapes how people are able to interact or live in those places. Um, but we're also thinking about the macro level of how how we understand spaces, what 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 are we meant to do in them, what's the what are the norms around behaviour and feeling um, and interaction in those spaces and, and by those net norms who are we including and excluding. Um, when we're thinking about particular places, we think about what are their feeling rules, what 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 are people able to do and not do in those spaces, what are we preventing? And sometimes things that look like they're nice or therapeutic and not necessarily the same thing as affording what people need to do in the space. Um, there's this real tension and I don't really know how to, um, how, how, to, how to manage this tension because people in distress or in crisis seem to need both privacy and confinement, both agency and, you know, but, but I mean both privacy and agency. And those take different meanings on for different people in different ways. And privacy can become confinement and agency can become exposure or kind of being outside can become exposure. So it's quite, I think those are not, they're not simple. Um, this is what people need to be able to do. It's it, that there are tensions and they, the two conflict as well when people are in states of distress. But generally what people, need is a sense of control and agency over their um, experiences and the ability to manage them and also people are creative and um, use actively order and manage their spaces and the objects within them in order to um, um, in order to help themselves recover and to manage and modulate their experiences in um, in beneficial ways okay thank you How, how long was that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Five minutes left for questions. Oh, my God, you should have told me. I didn't realise. Oh, there's a QA. and a Oh, OK. All right. I'll, I'll read this one out. So there is an increasing evidence of the role of the microbiome in shape, shaping mental health within the built environment. What, if any, is the scope of this biological-based research to inform policy and design, architecture and planning of spaces that improve mental health and well-being in general populations? So, um, are you, I'm not sure I completely understand which kind of um research you're talking about um i mean as you know everything we are all uh, all mental health is um mediated through biology because we are biological um i suppose i've always um operated at the level of our subjective experience rather than the biological um because the ways in which people understand and experience and make sense of those kind of biological experience vary. Um, so I suppose the answer to that is I'm not sure because I don't know exactly what research you're talking about. But I, I think that 
understanding kind of how we biologically react to environments is really important and interesting and um yeah i think it it sounds interesting <laughs> Oh, we've got a few more questions coming up. Great. Um, oh yeah, from Anthony Clark. Are there any architecture examples that you think have been working in the space exceptionally well? Um, so I think that there's, um, there are a number of uh, places for crisis that have gone down a route of being more home-like so um, rather than setting rather than kind of institutional spaces um, are built to look like homes kind of have soft furnishings ha and, and kind of focus on comforts um, rather than necessarily um, trying to look um, therapeutic or um, like a hospital and those seem to be um, I mean it's you know it's it's a, always an interaction between the 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 architecture and the practices that happen within it so I guess they also work in different ways as well but I think places where people can engage with them in varied ways are really important um, so lots of um, institutional places have a very single use so they're they're quite flat kind of spaces whereas places which are more home-like um, tend to have different varieties of ways of um, engaging with them so I think yeah those kind of places I think work better. Okay. So I've also got one from um, Lucy um, who said hi Laura great talk thank you I agree um, I'm <laughs> designing and planning open and public space and community facilities. I'm wondering if you have any advice about creating therapeutic nodes in our cities. Um, so that would be lovely. Um, but I think the probably the answer to the other one of the first the other question as well is um, ask people who are um, who are having experiences of mental health um, about what they need and where they like to go because of course what we also see is that people use spaces in different ways so with, it's kind of difficult to create one place but it's really about making sure that design is inclusive um, and that it includes these experiences which are not necessarily easily included in our public spaces so I really think bottom-up inclusive design practices are probably the best rather than me telling you what it should look like I think that's probably the best way to go. Mm -hmm. No palm tree index or anything. No. <laughs> um, so Tina Britton asks, are there any resources you'd recommend to guide the design of public space to mental health? Um, so there's there's been quite a lot of um, so um, so I think there's the Happy Cities book, which is about um, more about um, well-being, mental health. There's a few quite a lot of that stuff around in um, urban planning at the moment. I really like Richard Sennett's work as well that he talks about um, how we can build cities which are open and which generate interaction and generate um, a, in kind of um, generate interaction between groups and people rather than excluding or um, putting up barriers between people. Um, so those those kind of areas I think in terms of mental health most of the built environment stuff tend to be more about institutional spaces um, which is kind of why I wanted to talk about this today as well because there is a bit of a gap in terms of public space and what what it's like to navigate public space um, with mental health problems which as I said at the beginning most people have to do now. Okay, so Nicola Hancock asks, that, or says, fantastic presentation, Laura. To our team's surprise, space seems really central to some people's ignition of hope for mental health recovery. My question, how are you engaging in COVID impacts on space and mental health? And you must come to Australia and explore our forensic mental health environment and how they facilitate and hinder hope and recovery. Um, well, I'm hoping to work with Marley on a project um, about thinking about COVID um, 
from people coming out of lockdown um, in Australia. Um, I would I would love to come to Australia. I'm not sure we'll be allowed to leave the UK for a while with our with our terrible high um, infection rates, I believe. But um, yes, I think in terms of the forensic services, um, one of the things that we've been thinking about quite a lot is that the spaces there are so focused on risk and prevention and preventing risk and that they end up locking everything down and it's really difficult to generate um, kind of hope and recovery in those spaces so um, I'm just writing up some stuff about that at the moment which I'm very willing to share. We are going over time so if people have to leave that's that. Sorry everyone. <laughs> We'll just um, say so. Marie asks, um, she says, really interesting presentation. How do we build more cross disciplinary research? Any hints for what works? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is um, this is a place where you need to work in a cross disciplinary in a way and. Um, I suppose one of the things is about um, taking a bit of time just to get to know what each other are doing, but also that there's often very similar things that are talked about in different literatures, just using slightly different language. So part of it is is about seeing where where there's already stuff that's been done, but maybe not quite from your um, perspective. So or um, so I think it's about getting people together really and getting them to talk about what their understandings are and then see where the where the gaps are and where the and what's already out there. There is there is a lot of relevant stuff out there. It's just um all in different silos a lot of the time. All right, I'm gonna do a quick fire with the last two questions to get through. Um I'm interested in your thoughts on incorporation of nature exposure within built environment to improve mental health and well-being. As contact with nature is known to provide respite and restoration. And quickly, a second question um, from Tina, who is I'm really interested in doing a PhD looking at the relationship between urban planning and mental health. She already has a planning degree and she's doing a psych degree. Would it be better to do such a topic within the psychology faculty or the architectural faculty? Oh, it depends on the faculties in question. <laughs> so um, I, I would look for people who who you want to work with rather than focusing on the faculty and also maybe try and get people across across the two if you can um, but you know there is different bits of psychology and different bits of architecture so it depends on on who's who's open to it really um, for nature yes i think it's really important to bring nature in um, and um, I think although I talked about the kind of restoration, respite kind of literature, which is very well established, I think there's something much more fundamental about our need to be near and connected and see nature, which is a kind of deeper psychological um, meaning uh, of the natural world. Um, but certainly there's, there's lots of design um, about how to bring nature into the city and use more kind of natural and I don't different materials and stuff and I think all of that is really really positive and the more you can get it into urban environments the better. Okay. From Joe, very quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm, as a consultant who works with architects and developers to review the impact of their designs, would you suggest that there is a strong need for more semi-private spaces to be incorporated into new apartment and mixed use developments to allow effective transition from public to private spaces? Do you think we need to rethink the high use, the design of high rise to incorporate new designs? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, there's, I think that um, thinking about how people live in the space and how people engage you know we need to live on a kind of a human scale level um, with other people and that, that can be incorporated within high rises and multi occupancy places but it need, it does need careful management and the the evidence seems to be that um, intermediary spaces are really important for people to feel like they have control and ownership over where they're living <laughs>
So yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Laura. I really enjoyed the presentation. I'm sure everyone else did too. So thank you. I'm sorry I went so badly over. I didn't have a clock. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you.